Hello, my name is Deepika Suraji and welcome to Kalpana 2021. Once a year, we at the Arts and Culture Portfolio at the Tata Trust look forward to holding Kalpana, a space to imagine the arts through some of our programs and projects, interlinking ideas and processes, challenges and triumphs by engaging with various stakeholders. In the last version of Kalpana in December 2019, we held it under the stars at the Kuli Kutub Shah Heritage Park in Hyderabad, a site where the Trust was supporting the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in the conservation of nine major monuments. In an evening centered around conservation, we screened Ritvik Katak's Megida Katara, a superbly restored version graciously lent to us by Shivendra Singh Dungarpur, whose Film Heritage Foundation was holding the Trust-supported film preservation workshops the following week. It is only in retrospect I see how special an evening it was. Just a couple of months later, our tiny, a tiny mRNA strand sent our planet into lockdown. But that evening, a hundred or so audience watched the screen shine as Katak's classic about Bengal, migration and famine played out on a large screen surrounded by wonderfully restored monuments. What was extra special was that a large chunk of the audience were the craftsmen and workers conserving the site. Migrants from Bengal, they watched mesmerized in Hyderabad, a film in their language, Bengali. It was an evening that brought together built heritage conservation and film preservation, both areas of the trust work in. It seems a luxury now. So many gathered together in the chill of the evening, watching a film, workers on site doing work that cannot be done digitally. So many heads pouring over film and microscopes the following week at Annapurna Studios. Today we convene on a virtual platform, but I think it will be as enriching an experience with the speakers we have, discussing what it takes to keep a monument in a public space, both of whom that we've, we've, had, work, we've had the privilege of working with. With Kaivan Mehta as one of the curators of the Trust Support of UDRI State of Architecture and State of Housing Exhibitions, and Rakesh Nanda, CEO of the AKTC, Aga Khan Trust for Culture on two projects that the Trust have supported at Humayun's tomb and at the Kuli Kutub Shah Heritage Park, and whose tireless work and leadership in the sphere of built heritage is a constant source of amazement. To introduce them, my colleague Paruma Sadna will do justice to their vast experience. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thanks, Deepika. Just to briefly introduce Taiwan and Ratisha, two speakers today. Taiwan Mehta is a theorist and critic in the field of visual culture, architecture, and city studies. He's currently the managing editor of Domus India and heads the doctoral program in architecture at SEPT University, Ahmedabad. Kaivan writes on architecture and city issues and has curated many significant exhibitions, including co-curating along with Rahul Mehrotra and Ranjit Foskote, the Tara Trust's supported State of Architecture and State of Housing exhibitions in 2016 and 2018, respectively. He's also the author of two books, Alice in Guleshwar and The Architecture of Ayan Sadhu. Ratish Nanda is a conservation architect and the India CEO of Aga Khan Trust for Culture and has been associated with the Trust for over a decade. He leads multidisciplinary teams in undertaking major urban conservation projects in India, like the conservation of Humayun's tomb and the current setup of the Humayun's tomb site museum, preparation of a specifications manual for built heritage conservation, and the Kutub Shahi Heritage Park Conservation in Hyderabad. All of these projects have received the support of Tata Trust. Ratish has written extensively on Delhi's built heritage and has traveled as an ICMOS expert to missions in Iran, Turkey, and Nepal. He's also received several awards and grants for his work. Welcome, Kaivan and Ratish, and Thank over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you much, Dr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paroma, and thank you very much, Deepika and Kalpana and the Tata Trust for bringing this session together and uh, bringing me and Ratish together. And it's uh, it's wonderful talking to talking to Ratish. And actually, uh, I, I think it's a it's a conversation that has been planned because uh, we all felt it's a moment. It's a timely moment right now to discuss uh, some of the issues that we plan to bring up in this conversation. Uh, let me sort of, uh, Ratish, if you if you allow me, I'll just sort of 
make sure. a few preliminary preliminary yeah. notes and i think uh, this is where we come together all of us uh, as tata trust you in your role and position and and for me to be somebody who's who's writing or thinking about or teaching some of these issues uh, constantly uh, i've i've had a feeling for a for a while that you know uh, from the high point of uh, important conservation debates in the 1990s you know especially with the bombay legislation the maharashtra state and mumbai legislation in the mid 1990s what uh, what was happening in 19 uh, in bombay delhi calcutta and around that around that time period to the present moment we have traveled a considerable considerable distance and today uh, more and more as uh, at one level i think the issues are becoming complex and complicated at certain levels and i think the debates around the hall of nation uh, or 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 in a in a different way the debate around the recent the most recent debate around uh, the iim ahmedabad uh, campus has literally indicated that the way we have been discussing conservation in many many ways will require a certain amount of rethinking reworking relooking at how the practice has shaped and in that sense for example the uh, the aga khan work the aga khan trust work and the work that uh, y'all have been doing has also in a certain way set up certain methods set up certain standards set up set up certain directions in which sort of conservation uh, looking at looking at campuses looking at larger precincts looking at particular monuments and engaging with a larger sort of a public public discourse so in a certain way these 30 years have really moved far and wide i think and in many ways i think it will be important for us to take a take a take a look at what these 30 years have meant in in fact i've been sort of pushing and especially more accept because i'm i'm involved there i've been literally pushing that we are setting up conservation and heritage conservation departments but we literally don't have a, a a kind of a manual of studies or we don't have uh, for want of a better word i'm saying a textbook which is literally telling us how projects have been have been handled whether they have been handled by individual architects whether they have been handled by uh, say ngos or trusts or working organizations or even collaborative Uh, uh enterprises have come together and i think these are all different models that have taken shape they've all happened spontaneously depending on a on a situation and now i think it's really important for us to look back and see how far we have come and how we would take this forward for say the next 20 30 30 years and i think i would really like you to come in at this moment in a in a certain way of uh, reflection but a reflection on on the subject of conservation with the intention of what's the direction that you see we would be moving into thank you my god um, that is intense guy one thank you this is already a pleasure um you know you know you you right guy one you you right when you say that since the early talk of the 1990s when agk menon and mm. uh, people were really starting to talk about what india should be doing to now we we moved a lot forward we've had uh, see significant impact of the support that the tata trusts have given to conservation we've created some model projects but you know we've also lost a lot the last 30 years has been for me a time of great loss of architectural heritage urban transformations not necessarily for the good i mean even if you look at the golconda setting the 1990s mm. you could see the jubilee hills and today mm. you know you're surrounded by uh, you know not a single tree um right. so urban transformation has been rapid and uh, a loss of building has been rapid in that sense um, so it's it's a bit of both and as such um, you know what we realize what we've been doing at um, at aktc uh, with the, both the delhi project the humayun stoom nizamuddin area and with the, the qutub shahi tombs in golconda is to demonstrate that conservation can help meet a lot of government objectives i mean after all right. uh, you know employment creation uh, keeping the craft skills alive but creating public spaces um you know uh, and this has been uh, you know his highness the aga khan since the 1970s when the aga khan historic cities program was formed 
has been talking about historic urban spaces and unesco has later used that as a uh, you know as a historic urban landscape resolution in 2015 these are important documents because they're saying no longer is conservation limited to humayun stone only you have to look mm. at nizamuddin you have to look at sundar nursery you have to look at the buffer zone you right. have to look at the whole page you have to see how people's lives are improved and in a country like us you know 1990s agk menon and all of these people were saying in india conservation cannot be about monuments it has to be about right. how it can help improve quality of life and that is equally valid today um we have to ride piggyback on the environment movement i mean you can knock down yeah. a building but you can't knock down a tree so we have to piggyback uh, so both at the qutub shahi tombs and at uh, humayun tomb we planted over 20000 trees over last 20 years um, yeah. you know these trees are also buffer against uh, national highways coming through these sites which has been proposed and uh, and and so on but you know the point is making our heritage relevant to our people through access public access through uh, great spaces through pride in its heritage communal harmony uh, mm. through tangible heritage of food music monuments and uh, um, you know and and fulfilling other government objectives for example at humayun tomb we put in 128 rainwater harvesting pits now the ministry of jal shakti is going to asi and saying let's do rainwater harvesting at the monument right okay. so i think through conservation we can teach a lot we can mm-hmm. win a lot but we have to make that case i mean one of the things that i would want to request other trusts and everybody else is to look at these two projects and even academic institutions like yourselves at uh, kaiwan is to look at these projects and see what the economic impact of doing this conservation has been for example in new york they built this uh, you know this uh, old train track which became a, yes. a public garden yes. and the high line and you high know line. they have spent i don't know 10 million dollars or whatever but they they say the economic impact of that development on new york alone has been worth over a billion mm. dollars that mm. impact mm. needs to be studied in the indian government because in the end people need to understand that conservation leads to more economic opportunity right right ratish this uh, uh there are two two things i want to pick up from here one is i think uh, this very important thing that that the idea of conservation has moved literally into a certain kind of an urban intervention and urban intervention not in terms of uh, putting an architectural piece there but in terms of how you're impacting a much larger uh, area whether it's a neighborhood whether it's an area so this sense of the conservation's relationship with a certain notion of the urban i think that's something that is turning out especially in the nizamuddin project i think that's something that that we should talk uh, and i would love to hear from you more on more on that but the other very interesting thing has been the environmental uh, environmental movement and and the way i think in many many cases the heritage and the environmental movement has has tied uh, into into each other so if you could expand a little bit more on these two uh, relationships the conservation to the urban and conservation to the environment and and uh, and the other word that that struck me very importantly it may sound overused but i think it's a very important word which is relevance i think this this relevance and and i have been sort of uh, looking at some of the reports and the books that you'll create after after projects and i've i've just recently seen uh, i think it's an aga khan uh, publication of on on complete cities so i think there's an aga khan publication on particular cities where they've had a a a good amount of professional investment through history heritage etc and i think that is very important in terms of creating the relevance to people's lives as they matter today and i think this is a big and a very important shift in the conversation on 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 conservation and and if you could speak a little bit more because i think even during the covid period at nizamuddin etc i think there was a there was a certain involvement even at the public health uh, public health level of the of the project so the relevance then does not stay only to the question of a monument but the monument becomes a trigger literally to look at somebody's everyday everyday life so this spectrum has come out quite interesting in your first uh, first response so you know kaiwan as a conservation professional i remember mm. Uh, about five years ago, six years ago, there was this big conference in Kyoto, 
and I was sent as representative of the government of India. Um, and we were all about 500 people in this room from across the world, uh, generously hosted by um, by the government of Japan. And we were talking about how conservation can improve what we what we at the Aga Khan Development Network call quality of life. Mm-hmm. And that room of 500 people, they were only conservation professionals. Um, so, you know, it was a self goal to start with. But for us, uh, you know, His Highness, the Aga Khan, you know, the Aga Khan Development Network includes many agencies. And we all work mm-hmm. towards a single objective of improving quality of life. Quality of life. And the Trust for Culture, we do it through culture. So we've been leveraging cultural assets to create economic opportunities across Hmm, the world, hmm. demonstrate how these things can be done. Now, um, when we started, we signed a single piece of paper with the three different government agencies, the Archaeological Survey of India in Delhi, Hmm. the Central Public Works Department and the Municipal Corporation of Delhi. And that was a big thing as a model because all three of them agreed the same objective. And, you know, three different government agencies saying we will all fulfill the same objective was an important thing. Mm, now, mm. that has given us, the first thing we did is we went into Nizamuddin, did a baseline survey, 20,000 people living. We realized less than 1% of women had economic opportunities. We realized uh, less than 9% of people had been to a park in the past 12 months. Oh. We realized 25% of people did not have in-home toilets. We realized uh, that the biggest problem in the mm. whole community, the biggest, single biggest problem they identified was garbage. Mm. Um, So we started in Nizamuddin not by fixing the incredible monuments that have been built there for 700 years, but by rebuilding a community school uh, or a primary school, which then had 600 kids. We, after a lot of cajoling permission, got permission to landscape open spaces for women, for community and all of that. I had yeah. a woman 80 years old touch my feet saying, Hum ad- the, aapne pura kar diya by making a park because all these women had nowhere to go when their families would come. Mm-hmm. Now they have their own park. Uh, we mm-hmm. started by collecting garbage. And what was a what was a barabola stretch has now become a public park with a lot of people engagement. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, this is important because it it is a, and we did a lot of work with health, education, vocational mm. training, and all of that to create economic opportunities. Um, it was, uh, you know, so so before we really started working with monuments, we had to win the trust of the community. Now, for far too long, Kaiwan, for far too long, us conservationists have been saying, get the community to conserve their monuments. You know, get community right, involved right, in conservation. Right, right. I mean, these people have no jobs, they have no food. Why would they worry about conservation? Absolutely. Now they're worried about conservation. Now, after 10 years of us making sure that 99.5% of the community benefits either by housing improvement, creating parks, job improvement. So now they understand that this is a historic area. We are privileged to live here. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. the people are going cleaning up the monuments. People are going and writing letters against their own neighbors for sort of doing wrong things at monuments and so on. Mm. But for far too long as conservation, we've been saying, get the community to get involved. No, the the thing to aim for is help heritage, improve quality of life for the people through economic opportunities, through public spaces, through, uh, you know, we build community toilets, we uh, we build women's gym, we have we started by garbage cleaning and today after six or seven years the program is now 20 percent subsidized by us which was 100 percent subsidized when we started so by the time we leave that will become sustainable and of course we have a we were we had women dying in childbirth in nizamuddin constantly so the women in health program again supported by the tata trust for many many years a community health program supported established by the tata trust has uh, saved lives has uh, and uh, you know in during covid times it is it mm-hmm. is so uh, you know so gratifying that we had not a single case in the first lockdown in nizamuddin even though okay. not a single case because we realized that there was going to be a crisis because of the tablighi jamaat we realized these congregations were happening we tried to reach out nobody listened to us 
but we started spreading awareness then and there so not one case mm -hmm. of covid in the community we did a house to house survey with the municipal corporation 1800 household not a single covid case till yeah. sort of august last year mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you know um, so it's i mean it was a time to step up it's not something that we could have avoided but uh, very gratifying we covid has shifted us back 3 years 4 years mm -hmm. because a lot of the youth we had 1800 youth from nizamuddin employed in different establishments as a result of the career training opportunities we gave them but a lot of them have lost their jobs there is a stigma associated with nizamuddin because of what happened with the outbreak right, right. so on so, but but the fact is this community is today empowered to take care of itself uh, our involvement of external experts has gone down to the bare minimum i think there are two or three people and 100 plus people running the program who are living there themselves a um, lot of environmental education water so we've connected hundreds of households to toilets to the sewer line so it's no longer the mess it used to be this is this is really fascinating because this sort of uh, the monument in the park or the monument in the landscape has really sort of now become the monument in the middle of people in a in a manner of speaking and also this uh, shift if one may say from sort of uh, conservation as history and heritage to conservation as uh, as livelihood and 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 sort of the relevance to everyday life of uh, people how would you sort of look at some of the shift in the in the debates around conservation the way they have come out are they useless debates today also let's let's also look at look at that and i think Uh, uh uh for me the debate uh for me the debate around uh hall of nations is somehow clear but for me the debate around the iim amdabad is is not very easy to easy to deal with and and there it is you are in a difficult situation as to how to talk about conservation and one can't just blindly say that because it's a it's a monument of modern architecture it should stay simple when the you know like my joke has become that you know the famous khan statement that uh, every brick wants to be an arch and i'm joking today saying that the brick is revolting and saying that i probably don't want to be an arch any longer in that uh, in that building but i think uh, i think how do we look at some of the debates and their their histories that in these in these last few years from your experience i think kevin what is happening is we have uh we have understood conservation to be associated with a dome or an arch which it's not conservation is a way of life mm -hmm. conservation is also about saving money it is also about uh, you know uh, you know so so it it's all of that um and often in our country where land values are much higher it's easier to knock down and rebuild because uh, you know the property the construction value is nothing compared to land value mm -hmm. uh, as a result um, delhi has lost all of its 1950s 60s 70s architecture it's all being redeveloped not by anybody else but by the government itself um, mm -hmm. and my concern is it's not even documented well i mean uh, today's mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. one has created virtual walk through so in future people could understand what this was about hmm, but it's hmm. being knocked down indiscriminately we're <clears throat> saving a lot of this heritage is trees because trees are more valuable than the 1950s right right uh, but you know in the iim for example um, you know it it might be considered easier cheaper uh, less effort to just knock the whole damn thing out keep one building and just build new buildings or more space on land um so this is i mean you know i think every specific thing gets into real debate but i think the big yeah. problem that i am happened is there was no prior discussion there was no prior involvement there was no prior yeah. engagement with the stakeholders um yeah. and that's yeah. what uh, nizamuddin has taught us i mean uh, we had to do street we uh, had to do street meetings even before we started mapping the streets or houses uh, right, so right. Right. you need to inform people this is not your personal property or personal house that you can get an interior mm. design mm. with as you wish i think for anything that is in the public domain a lot of engagement with the public needs to be done now this is an example we can learn from uk i mean the uk is size of uttar pradesh or at least undivided uttar pradesh mm. and um, the uk has about 650000 historic buildings protected by law where you can't change the color of a door without consultation mm. and the consultation is so streamlined that they come and put a notice saying so and so is changing right. the color of the door 
any neighbor who has a objection, please come and give us your objection. There are public meetings. They're all very civil about it. Uh, over here we'll be banging heads. Um, but but I think that engagement and which is what we're trying to do, which is what we're trying yeah. to do uh, at Sundar Nursery, at the Kutub Shai tomb, through signage, through social media, through publications. It, we're trying to. Uh, so a lot of time people ask me, "Fine, you've done it. You have lots of money. You've done it. Now what?" Um, mm. Question is, now means people have seen it. Sooner or later, people will say, "Why is conservation in India not done in this way?" Hmm. Um, you know, both for the IAM and all that. What we're trying to do, Kaiwan, in answer to your question is, we're trying to set up a process, which includes, right. which includes uh, documentation, a report, public discussion, hmm. uh, outcome of public discussion, approvals, implementation, informing the public, and then final report, which you mentioned you read. So as yes. long as a process is followed, you will not have objections whether you knock down something which has to be knocked down, provided you follow mm, the process mm. and you go through the process. process. If you demolish it overnight, obviously there will be concerns. Pa partly the question of the process that you that you raise and and the and the fantastic documentation uh, and summaries that you'll that you'll write in the process is also bringing me to this uh, to this question of um, creating material that will be required technically professionally to work in these places so for example i think i think one of the major things that iim has come up is that for all these years there has been very less information on the maintenance of a, such a such a large and now what appears to be also a delicate uh, delicate building i think i think obviously in your experience you must have gone through buildings very well constructed and also not so well constructed which you then have to struggle to 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 keep them and then what becomes the whole technical expertise to keep a building building standing and what is the cost i don't mean just the financial cost but you know the other costs involved in keeping a keeping a because i think uh, i think in the iim situation even the conservation that has gone through will keep requiring booster shots uh, so to so to speak so how does one how does one deal with this question of one is handling the technical technicalities of a project but the other is the to to produce a discipline in in architects in general but also with conservation to constantly produce maintenance development survival yeah. manuals for buildings yeah no absolutely so which is what uh, uh, parama in our kind introduction mentioned i mean the, we are we are right now on behalf of the tata trust engaged in creating uh, for the first time in 75 years of independence uh, specifications for conservation work in mm. india so now what happens is every uh, every circle of the asi does its own procurement does its own specification so for some strange reason there has been no attempt at you know putting it all together and what this document will do is it will make conservation as mainstream as construction because like a cpwd manual you'll have something okay this is how much right, we have to mix right. this is what we have to do now in the case of i am going back to the i am i think it's an important modern building even chandigarh is going to start facing similar problems sooner or later because these buildings are going to start crumbling so there has been a lot of work done uh, by the getty for example on modern architecture and its preservation mm. and then some iconic mm. buildings like falling water like I am, will need to be preserved. Uh, the question is, where are the funds going to come from? Now, uh, right. there is nothing, nothing, no building, not even the Taj Mahal is sacrosanct. If there is a problem that needs to be addressed, I don't think uh, building design changes uh, should be avoided. This is a debate one needs to have. I mean, how can you, I, I saw the cost of keeping one block and I was, I was uh, shocked. Uh, at I am so I mean I was to, to how do you do how do you reduce the cost of uh, doing conservation to keep these buildings in good maintenance I mean there there has to be a way even if it requires design changes because as yeah. I said conservation is a way of life and conserving money is as important uh, as conserving an individual building you can't endlessly throw good money after something that's just going to keep requiring booster shots as right, you say right so I think. I think the important thing and which is why this debate, this discussion with you is so important to me, because in the conservation world, we are not having these debates. We are not. Right, conservation right. is not mainstream. There is not enough discussion. There is not. It's the it's the 
is preaching to the converted but uh, hmm. you know in the public domain there is not enough discussion not enough knowledge so ratish do you think we will have to soon very consciously develop different models of conservation work like i've i've also been having a feeling and i've been saying this in conversations with people like ag k menon uh, etc that you know the debates or the or the things that we said for the pre 19th century pre 20th century architecture that we began the con- conservation debate with once we come to modern architecture the issues and problems are going to be very different even the politics on the ground or politics at the larger level of some of these buildings is going to be much more complex than simply you know because when you look at something that is pre 20th century at least you can you can have a certain sense of nostalgia you can talk about a certain sense of heritage those issues work sometimes at an emotional level too and they have worked in the in the early phases but i think with more and more sort of looking at things around us in the last 100 150 years probably we'll have to develop different models of approaching approaching these these questions what do you think about this i think kevin i'll go back to what i said before i think uh, hmm. you know conservation cannot be done in adverse political circumstances if the hmm. government today uh, chooses to knock down something that is in its own possession uh, there is very little uh, anything can be done but uh, over there also there should be room for public debate not just Absolutely. criticizing or abusing but actually making a case to save something uh, as a client if something doesn't uh, work then you know but at the minimum what should be done is it's properly documented at least virtually uh, so that future generations can experience it mm. uh, building mm. even if it's digitally that is the minimum but otherwise for any building whether it's a 16th 6th century or whatever building or a 21st century if you have a process that is defined so i think the important thing with conservation which we all forget is defining the significance now and defining what the problem and before you come to it you have to document the building you have to understand its significance you have to understand why this building is important is it because of the person it's associated with it's mm. because of its architectural grandeur is it because it stands in an important archaeological ensemble that hundred reasons that there could be and mm. once you figured out what is the significance of the site then it's easy to come up with a solution for example at isa khan's tomb we said the significance is the ornamentation so we had right. to then go back and restore the ornamentation mm. uh, you know mm. at rahim's tomb we said the significance is rahim himself mm. you know so we actually put back a grave Uh, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. unheard of in conservation you know and uh, and 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 so on so you know every so once you've identified that and put it down in writing then it becomes easy at rahim stone we had over 60 independent peer reviews because the, what we were doing was so important and so off stream because as you know for 100 years india has been saying we'll only do preservation which in my yes. opinion is nothing more than kam chori the <laughs> You know, the bara charter in australia 40 years ago said preservation is only to be done when no other conservation intervention can be attempted awesome. so you know 40 years later we need to wake up and the national policy of asi was revised after the homayun stone conservation in 2014 they notified it and they are now saying restoration is fine reconstruction is fine craftsmanship is very important the problem is they have not the policy has not been trickled down to their own card Hmm, 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 but hmm. process i think india needs to define the process any building any historic building any building that you want to knock down 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 steps you need to go through and you'll be fine but also public discourse is going to be very important because i i remember the the lawyers who were involved in the hall of nations case and and they said you know one of the things and this was in a panel discussion so uh, we were we were talking generally and one they said one of the things was who is this building important to you keep saying this building is important this building is important but and 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 my argument at that point you know we have bloody 500 schools of architecture and 500 into sort of 200 students at an average we couldn't even put that kind of an audience out saying yeah. that this building is significant or is so 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 creating a public discourse besides the very important process that you have been emphasizing that's going to be absolutely necessary and i think more and more now uh, than probably uh, maybe in the 1990s the early days that whole uh, uh, experiment of public discourse was important but probably now it's going to be equally uh, uh, a big fight 
it's a it's a horse and carriage or chicken and egg guy one see um, already students are um, more inspired by the glass towers than <laughs> we think of value uh, they all want to build these egoistic monuments i think our uh, heritage becomes too stereotype for absolute. for the way students heritage handle it that's my no, if the they reason, handle it it's that's the reason it's stereotyped is because it's seen as throwing good money after bad it's like you know it's it's the value of heritage is not understood in terms of pride in terms of economic opportunities in terms of improving quality of life in in terms of trying to bridge communal divides in mm-hmm. terms of all of those which we are trying to do so so what so that's why i said it's a chicken and egg because the whole of nations was losing battle from the start a the owner wanted to let it go and let it go at any rate b uh the debate was uh vicious rather than uh you know participatory it was done in the open public debate rather than mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. getting it but most importantly people were like what the fu- what the what is the fuss about you know mm-hmm. it's 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 mm-hmm. it's not the taj mahal i mean our limited understanding of heritage is the taj mahal yes. taj mahal yes. is heritage nothing else is heritage and till we can demonstrate that people's quality of life will improve by keeping these heritage assets that you know these are and the rules the rules are crazy 100 meters prohibited zone i mean kaun pagal hai ki hindu kisi duniya mein kahin nahi hai either india we can't even implement our rules you make a rule like this 100 meters prohibited i've been shouting from the rooftops that the 100 meter should be the most intensive development for the sake of the monument you improve right, the right, streets right, right. you make the gardens you put the street lamps you make you know make it uh, improve the put in money and improve people's houses so they become mm, mm. so instead of saying prohibited which is a joke you you sort of say okay this if you're living within 100 meters you won the lottery because we're going to invest in your house we're going to invest in making your space right, better right 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 you know, right the law itself is crazy and in india anyway nobody listens to the law and you have no incentives so people mm. in 100 meter should be given tax incentives should should sort of people who own historic building should be saying okay no property tax change the value of your change the use of your property give any sort of incentive you know uh, mm. you know uh, you know follow your uh, what you're saying uh, but the india lacks incentive india and this is going to take decades and before then god help any hall of nation building because till it is ingrained into us like it is ingrained in the british society that every historic building right, has great right, value right. Right. but in a, in a in a sense i think that larger at one level a popular debate beyond the professional debate including obviously one has to talk seriously about in, improving even the quality of professional debates i think before we even move to the to the popular debate otherwise it's a it's a bunch of people who understand or who who like to talk about or think about something are are talking so i think and 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 on the other hand the outreach and the media so how does sort of journalism report you know there, there was tons of newspaper stories that came after it was demolished but i don't remember very significant stories that came in the press before or when the hall of nation debates was were were in fact going on a few interviews yes there were things done so i think at at that level also is it is it that we will have to push at that level also at 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 some level so i think what the tata trusts are doing uh with the art conservation work hmm. in terms of establishing programs intensive programs sometimes mid career uh i think uh, i think that in in a few years time will have the impact in the art conservation world mm-hmm. and i think uh, i think similar programs uh, i'm not saying tata trust should do everything but similar programs are needed for mid career professionals for right. reports studies scholarly articles phd's on yes. the state of the built environment so your work is huge very significant kaivan because what you are able to talk about in terms of the urban environment is mm-hmm. nobody else is doing that so um, mm-hmm. uh, so i think that needs to become mainstream people are not recognizing uh, how uh, you know they recognize afterwards ki hamare yahan to aise hota tha you know mm-hmm. now it's gone you know you <laughs> from the baby with the bath water and yeah, now what yeah, you talking yeah. about people like uh, you and me because of our experience and our knowledge can understand what's going to happen 20 years from now you know uh, i mean near my near my house they have authorized uh, 
uh, 20 towers of 28 floors each on a 20 acre plot in the heart of delhi uh, to house government employees and i'm like okay we should get out of here soon because you know the same sewerage system the same roads the same water supply is now going to be spread very thin uh, but people don't realize ki tower hi to laga rahe hain kya farak padta hai you know hmm, that other hmm, impact hmm. um uh, i think it's that wholesome development which we are not seeing the metro guy is going to only look at the shortest corridor for his metro network the you mm. know the forest guy is only going to look at something so it's it's it, that integration somehow we've not worked out in india no that was no, that the argument was... i was saying when when for example there were a lot of these things of shivaji park and the sort of 3 4 5 story buildings at shivaji park becoming so i was saying they don't understand that the premium of shivaji park is the scale the day you have even five or six out of all those buildings changing the shivaji park is not the 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 quality that you are there for is not going to remain any longer so this sort of broader outlook and i think it's a it's a much wider and you rightly say i think right from professional education whether it's whether it's phd's or whether it's our it's our teaching programs to the sort of widening of the discourse is is absolutely important at a public at a public level at a wider public level and i think those are areas some concentration would be would be good and you i think saying, demonstration yeah. project to demonstrate oh. how it can be done because you know the law is can be changed overnight um, as mm-hmm. we've all seen i think uh, what is clear is demonstration now everybody fights for a tree because they know that a tree is important mm-hmm. for oxygen so i think it's demonstration projects and there are a few happening i'm aware of this project around the lingraj temple in bhubneshwar which there a lot of uh, you know effort is being done um, and there are i think somebody needs to compile all of these projects uh, somebody like yourself no, absolutely that's that's so, what i've been saying like a book of case studies case of study. like 30 40 case studies is i think is going to be the most important thing for us to us to put together and again accessible at at a student level professional level but also at a wider wider reading reading level so i mean a similar effort at new delhi i mean you know the mm. whole bungalows everybody says why should these ministers live in two acre plots but because they're living in two acre plots there is less traffic on the road there is mm. more degree. there is the temperature in central delhi is 2 degrees 3 or 2 to 6 degrees lower so uh, from the historic point of view i think this new development of central vista is not really uh, you know it's not really going to from the historic building point of view not not really so all this you know chest beating about the fact that um, uh, you know this is being destroyed what is going to change is the climate is the impact of that with all mm. this uh, but again that is the decision of the government of the day that they want all of these uh, places and uh, Uh, we can debate on how to do it um, but i think uh, i think i think the reason that i mean there is absolutely no dialogue which is the big problem that's the yeah, yeah and i think yeah. we need to create these forums of dialogue where do you think are going to be more and more the pressure points it's it's evident in many of the different things that you have uh, you have said but where do you think are going to be the real pressure points in the next 20 years of this work i think uh, unfortunately uh, you know it's uh, it's everywhere uh, i mean you're talking about shivaji park hmm. now the point is find five floors you can accommodate 100 people and with 20 floors you can accommodate 500 people and there are 500 people hmm. so the population pressure is so high and uh, and it's uh, at sundar nursery it's incredible that the diversity of people who are coming together but then our biggest challenge has been that every one of those people wants the place to themselves or themselves and doesn't want so the bird lovers want it only for the birds and <laughs> you know the walkers only want it for the walkers and the dog lovers only want it for the dog but i mean there is so much stress between people saying that they don't see this as a place for everybody just as we we close ratish uh if you could also just you know working with multiple agencies i think uh, whether it's government whether it's funders and at the, obviously the community level you have you have spoken about 
this dynamics uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about this dynamics uh, i think in the in the heritage space and in the urban environment space we cannot only talk to one agency on hindsight you know when we signed the mou for the mm. delhi project it took us a long time because not asi mcd and the cpwd were not the municipal corporation were not willing to sign together so i kept saying let's sign with one and start something and my bosses from all the 40 50 years of other contrast for experience worldwide said no we'll get them all together the smartest thing we did because when you want to work in a public domain you need everybody mm, and mm, and mm. there is no shortcuts to it you need those thousands of meetings you need you need to engage with and the officers change every day you know so it's it's that engagement has to happen and that uh, uh, unfortunately so you need the mix that works is multiple agencies uh, one at least one central non government or academic institute i mean we could be replaced by sept in doing a project of this scale mm, uh, or mm, or mm, resident mm. welfare association and then a uh, a whole group of donors uh, to do a large project across 300 acres has required us significant support uh, you know of agencies mm. such as the tata trust but also corporates international governments and so on so i think the only way forward to work to do meaningful work is not only work with one agency but to get everybody together so a, so a conglomerate a collaborative uh, intention you know, is very very necessary historic cities have so many issues that you cannot address mm. all of them if you don't put everybody on the table and and lastly you you kept mentioning peer review which i think is is also there in your reports what would you say should be the checks and balances how does one sort of review the work that is being being done since I it involves the, a lot of public investment in terms of see, money emotion livelihood everything see more importantly from our as a, as a conservation architect what is most important is we need to be assured that we are not doing something that is going to be detrimental in the long run and we cannot be sure of that if the decision making is limited to a one person one institution or one group so to 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 uh, spread the net wider to get wider opinions the idea would be to seek independent peer reviews both from institutions and experts mm -hmm. but also we used so many peer reviews not only to inform the project but also inform opinion leaders of how conservation is right, done right right because right. a lot of opinion leaders say oh you know you guys are the expert we don't know that is not true right. you are an intelligent person it's your heritage you know so we we also right, try to right 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 we use the peer review process both to get informed but also to engage with opinion leaders i think that's that's absolutely very important because i think as much as we were talking about creating this sort of popular base of awareness i think people who have an opinion and whose opinion matters creating a level of dialogue is 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 very important there and i think both the cases in the modern heritage that we mentioned whether it is uh, the hall of nations iim and i think there is some achievement that the charles korea foundation has had when it has been to uh, uh, the building in the charles korea building in uh, uh, goa so i think this this levels of conversation and dialogue become seriously seriously important uh, pratish this has been wonderful uh, wonderful one hour uh, chatting with uh, chatting with you and i think the the sense that this is such a live uh, subject and and sphere that we are working in that these kind of conversations will be probably required on a on a very regular basis at various Absolutely. various levels uh, Absolutely. to sort of literally evaluate week by week or month by month what is what is the mood of of the place and what is the mood of the country and how we are dealing with some of these uh, some of these issues and how it turns into a full fledged professional uh, uh, practice especially since people are getting degrees as conservation architects i think it's very important to understand what is the responsibility of a practice uh, especially now with this 30 years that we have put uh, we we have behind us in that way thank you very very much uh, charatish and, and dipika and paroma it's it's to you now thank you very much that was really an illuminating uh, conversation um which um you know uh, just took it from such an expansive um area right down to the nitty gritty and it just showed what it takes to keep a monument in the public space and also um 
what was fascinating and and was drawn and was brought out was how um, many stakeholders are involved and how it's not mm. just about uh, conservation architects, which is I think kind of the the fallacy out in the public space that you know it's the, it's all about the conservation architect and his team. And Ratish has rightly said in you know both the large project the Tata Trust have been involved with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, of how many uh, government agencies, how many funders are necessary, what it takes to go and talk to the community even before the project starts. And I think um, Kaivan rightly said, we've only touched on the many aspects that I know that both you and Ratish have, we've had conversations in the past hmm. and we get you both back for many more of these conversations, <laughs> probably on a bi-monthly basis or a monthly basis. <laughs> Also, what was brought out very um, uh, highlighted was um, the quality of life, which is what conservation of a monument, uh, a heritage monument in a public space should be about. And um, and when it's done rightly, how Arati showed the shift from uh, a community asking why should we be involved to then automatically coming into uh, that whole um, area of working together and collaboratively with with their own governments to keep that place. On that note, Ratish, I would like to end by asking you about a city that's in everyone's mind at the moment, Kabul, where I know that the Aga Khan Trust for Culture did work on the Bage Babu and you were there uh, working on that site. And um, to what it takes now and how do you see um, these public monuments are constantly in jeopardy because you never know what's going to happen next. So are there any um, uh, are there any steps that are taken or concrete ways that um, we can also put down as and draw up as a kind of uh, guideline requesting uh, uh, you know I mean is requesting is uh, is rather <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on how do you uh, keep it from further damage are there any ways or what do you see uh, is going to happen to something that has become such a public space now um, and enjoyed by so many in Kabul. Well, Deepika, it's, it's heartbreaking what's happening in Afghanistan. Um, I think 20 years ago when we started um, restoring Bage Babur, it was everybody in Kabul was like, what the hell are you doing? We need hospitals, we need schools. Why the hell are you trying to restore a historic garden? And um, and that time the case had to be made um, for everything that we stand for. And uh, I think... Um, I think the work that we did led to about uh, 20 to 30,000 visitors coming to Bagi Babur every week for decades. Um, but I think the, the, so it's become the most important public space. It's become the place. And we, you know, even a small thing about moving out in 1960s or a 1980s swimming pool, we were able to get the women into the park. So it really became the women's park. And I think I'm hoping, praying that it'll stay because it's such an important public space um, in Kabul, but it needs a bit of maintenance. You know, even a simple thing like stealing of the pumps will mean the whole vegetation will go. So it will take as simple an act as stealing five pumps um, to really kill the garden. Um, so it's, these are these are fragile systems. But on the flip side, we've got people who love Bage Babur Almost 100% of our staff in Afghanistan is local Afghanistan, one or two expats. So the, the community has been empowered. Um, it's, um, it knows how to take care of it. Uh, for the last 10 years, Bage Babur on a five rupee ticket or a five Afghani ticket has made a profit of over $100,000 a year. Um, so it, it, it will be seen by the new government as a economic resource, as something people need. So I'm actually quite hopeful, quite confident that the garden will stay. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, I think, uh, and I think the local community loving Bhagya Babur and the local government seeing this as an economic generating activity will be two critical things for it. Well, on that hopeful note, thank you both very much for this conversation and we hope to get you, you back once again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.